In stark contrast to their days of dominance a few decades ago, the Williams team has been embroiled in a long-term struggle. But that could all change, as the team has recently made some major changes, and their car launch suggests that the team has the potential to make an incredible comeback in the coming years. So let's go over what we learned from the Williams preseason launch, why we believe the team has what it takes to turn things around, and what their new team principle has to do with it. Williams unveiled its 2023 Formula One livery at a season launch just days before the real FW45 makes its debut at a shakedown next Monday. Last year's FW44 was the first car to wear new blue and red branding designed by ex-CEO and team boss Joost Capito, who left Williams at the end of the year. This has been retained for the FW45, which won't break cover for real until it arrives at Silverstone for a filming day on the 13th. But the team did reveal key details about its 2023 Formula One car during its season launch event. Dave Robson, head of vehicle performance, described the car as a philosophical evolution of last year's machine, but with many visible changes. Some of these changes, such as raising the floor edges by 15 mm, are mandated by new regulations for the 2023 season. But there will also be another step forward in terms of the side pod concept debuted on Alex Albon's car at Silverstone last year. Visibly, well you'll see, but obviously the regulation changes around the floor dominate some of it, said Robson. The other thing that you'll find most obvious is a bit of an update to the side pod package, which is an evolution of what we did for the Silverstone upgrade package. But we were a bit constrained then by the radiator layout and not wanting to completely change that. So we've had the opportunity to work on that and lay things out a little bit differently. They're probably the main visible things. The Williams of last year was at its best on low downforce circuits like Monza and Spa, but it struggled on the majority of tracks where performance is dominated by the need for downforce across a wide range of different corners. This is an area where Williams has made an attempt to solve the problem with its new car. Last year's Silverstone upgrade aimed to improve the car's overall aero load, but the result was a somewhat whippy car that could be unstable in windy conditions. There were also issues with the front brake locking up in low-speed corners where the car struggled. The team is cautiously optimistic that it has improved these aspects with the new machine. Williams will continue to use the Mercedes power unit, gearbox and hydraulics. Robson also confirmed that Williams will continue to use pull rod rear suspension given this supply deal defines its design. But regardless of the fact that this design is effectively forced on it, he does not consider it a limitation of the FW45's design. The casing we still get from Mercedes, as we did last year, said Robson. We're quite happy with the architecture of the rear suspension. It works just fine for what we need to do. No problem there at all. Drivers Alex Albon and Logan Sargent have both spent the last month or so extensively testing the car in the driver-in-loop simulator. Albon says this has given him the impression that they're making inroads based on that, with the caveat that this is dependent on how well it correlates to real-world performance. He has set a goal of consistently finishing in Q2 in 2023 and is confident that the weaknesses of last year's car have been addressed. He also confirmed that the inconsistent through-corner balance of last year's car is less of a problem based on simulator experience. There were pretty obvious weaknesses in the car, said Albon. To name them, I can say low-speed front locking was quite a big problem for us last year, and we're trying to get around that and understand why it was so difficult. There's a common goal to improve the car in that area. Logan and I, even last year, had similar feedback. He knows the problems in the car as it's not totally new to him. He gets where the car needs to be quicker. So everyone's involved in the development and trying to address the weaknesses we had. Williams has long had a disadvantage in aerodynamic design when compared to the leading teams. Its initial interpretation of 2022's major aero Formula One regulations reset with a version of the zero side pod concept and wide outer floor channels was quickly found to be seriously lacking, and the team effectively redesigned the entire side pod area in time for the mid-season British Grand Prix. The resulting revised car appeared more conventional, with wider side pods and a frontal undercut, similar to the Alpine or Red Bull. Williams would have liked to do more, but was limited by budget. The side pods could have been sculpted more tightly to better feed the sensitive area around the rear brake duct, but the existing cooling radiator had to be kept. 
With that restriction removed, for this year's car, the biggest visual difference will be seen there when the actual FW45 appears. Last year's updated car was noticeably faster than the original, but a key limitation remained in combining a high level of downforce with consistent through-corner balance. This refers not only to differences in balance between entry, mid-corner and exit, but also to differences in those trays based on corner speed. The new regulations and their aerodynamically powerful underfloors posed a significant challenge in this area. Because downforce squares with speed, if there is an imbalance between the downforce acting on the front and rear of the car, the balance change can be significant throughout the speed range. It was a tray that Alex Albon had to deal with even in the upgraded car, which was even more sensitive than the original despite having more downforce. In terms of correcting their mistakes and mounting a long-term comeback to their former glory, the signing of ex-Mercedes Chief of Strategy James Vowles to the team principal role may have already been the best decision. But if Williams is to make a sustained rise up the Formula One pecking order in the coming years, it could do worse than give James Vowles the time, space and authority he requires to shape the team into his vision. If Williams needed proof that this would be a wise and successful course of action, it only needs to look at the recent experience of another fallen F1 giant in reversing its slide. Sixth place in the Constructors' Championship in 2018 wasn't McLaren's worst finish in the 2010s. After all, it was a significant step up from ninth place the previous year. But it was still a humbling year in which the flaws of its own offering were exposed after talking up its prowess amid Honda's early V6 turbo hybrid era struggles. Its response included bringing in former Porsche World Endurance Championship team principal Andreas Seidel. McLaren has never returned to the front of the pack since. However, it has finished 4th, 3rd, 4th and 5th in the constructor standings during that time and has finally won a race thanks to Daniel Ricciardo. And the freedom Seidel and to a lesser extent technical director James Key were given upon arrival meant that highlighting the flaws of McLaren's wind tunnel and simulator setup for example and getting the OK from CEO Zach Brown and later the board to commit to upgrading them was relatively simple. Something that should help McLaren future-proof when the wind tunnel comes online this year. There are already parallels between Seidel's and Vowell's appointments, with both being hand-picked by their respective operations. And one could argue that Williams, its owner Doralton Capital, and Vowell's would do well to follow McLaren's lead. His early influence now that he's been hand-picked by Doralton to lead the team could be quite interesting, said F1 journalist Scott Mitchell. I think his immediate priority would have to be to identify and address any damage that has been done over the past couple of years. This will be on the personnel side because there were a lot of stories. This isn't to say the previous regime was universally hated. There were almost as many stories saying Williams needed someone like that to come in and shake things up as there were stories about why it was a problem, but it was divisive. There's no question that Vowles is inheriting a divided team or a team that has suffered at the hands of a divisive policy. He will need to make sure everybody is aligned, but beyond that, I'm wondering if he might be able to have the autonomy that, say, Andreas Seidel had when he joined McLaren. When compared to their earlier struggles, Williams appears to be in a better position. Yes, they've dropped down the rankings from their impressive 2021 performance, but it also appears that the days of getting one or zero points, as they did in 2019 and 2020, are over. And with the revised regulations allowing lower scoring teams more time in the wind tunnel and with computer simulations, it's not hard to imagine that if they hit the nail on the head, we could see Williams battling it out in the midfield in a couple of years. But what do you think of Williams' chances of returning to the top of Formula One? Will James Vowles help or will he fail like those who came before him? Please let us know in the comment section below. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking it and subscribing. Be sure to click the bell icon to be notified of future uploads. Thanks for watching.